everyone. This is Kimia, and I have not spoken to you all in so long, and I've been missing you. I hope you've been missing me too. Usually, I come at you every Wednesday to do a Why Does He Do That Wednesday, and obviously, today is Thursday, so we're not going to do that today, but I promise you I'm going to come back next Wednesday with another Why Does He Do That Wednesday. Today, I want to talk to you about a really tough topic. The correlation between childhood sexual abuse and domestic violence. Two things that are often not talked about. These things are swept under the rug, especially in the African American community. So I'm ready to blow the lid off of it. Who's with me? Are you ready to blow the lid off of it? Because it's something we've got to talk about. Silence hides violence. And I'm not being silent anymore. Okay? So do me a favor, before we get started, I want you to share this broadcast. Share it, because you never know if this broadcast can help bring somebody some peace and relief, or it can actually save somebody's life, okay? All right, so let's get right into it. Um, I want to speak to you about this stuff, because in 2011, I almost died, and I don't want another person to go through what I had to go through. So sharing from my own personal experiences, classes I've taken, and books I've read, I'm going to bring different topics to you every week. So um, from the research that I've done and just looking at the research in my own experience, these are the few tips I want to share with you today. Number one, childhood sexual abuse usually starts at the age of nine. The average age is nine. But for myself, it started when I was five years old. Five years old. In my book, Born of Violence, I detail that on page five. No, seven. On page seven. So it says, uh, chapter one is called Santa Claus is Officially Dead. So it says... Ever since I was five, I felt like someone always had their hands or body on top of my body, touching my vagina, rubbing me, humping me, simulating sex with me, boys, girls, and men. So you think when this door of sexual perversion is open, where does it go from there, right? It only goes downhill. Um, most women that have encountered childhood sexual abuse at that age, later on, they start having risky sexual behaviors and they have multiple sexual um, partners. They even start having sex at a younger age. Like for myself, I started, I lost my virginity at 13 and I lost it um, to someone that was older than me. Okay. Probably because that experience that I had when I was five years old, happen with boys that were older than me okay so also when you uh, endure childhood sexual abuse you find that as an adult your relationships are really not satisfying you either end up being because you're searching 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 for this love that you didn't have so you end up being in multiple relationships with different people in search of love but you end up getting more sex okay um, you, a lot of times women end up having multiple sexual partners in quest of this love that they weren't getting and that they aren't getting. I know, um, sometimes I have, I have had friends in the past and I'm guilty of it myself. Um, as a younger person saying that, you know, I just had this voracious, you know, sexual appetite when in fact it really wasn't sex that, that women are after or that I was after, it was affection. So on page 11 in my book, I'm talking about from all of these experiences, I said, I learned one lesson that was detrimental to my emotional health and viewer relationships. I was pretty and all men wanted from me was sex. That's it. I was worth no more than the pleasure I could provide. Now, why did I say I learned that I was pretty? Well, because the sexual abuse always started that way. As a child, someone would go, oh, she's so cute. And I knew when that happened, oh, you are such a pretty girl. I knew that the sexual abuse was not far behind it. 
So the people that are, the women in particular that go through sexual abuse as a child usually have more sexual partners than non-abused women, all in quest of that love, okay? Um, also, I talked about real quick, a lot of times we have low satisfaction in those relationships. So a lot of times survivors of child sexual abuse over-sexualize. You'll notice, like as a teacher, I've seen um, young girls acting out towards boys in the, we called it the housekeeping area back then. Now I think it's called dramatic play. But they'll go over in that area and they will um, simulate sexual activity. And you'll know that they're probably being touched, okay? Now, what does that look like as an adult? You'll find yourself using sex to get your way for much of what you want. Now, what do I mean by that? I talked about that in my book too. Sometimes survivors think it's their obligation or duty to please the man, not thinking about a mutually satisfying relationship, just this is what I got to do in order to have something happen, okay? So on page 67, I talked about... One time I asked my ex-husband to put up some Christmas lights on the house. Now you would think something as simple as some Christmas lights I could just ask and it would be done. And honestly, I don't know if he would have done it simply by me asking, but when he resisted the first time, I resorted to what I knew. I went back to all those times I had been touched and what that ended up being. And I used it in this situation. So on 67, I said, I asked Terrence to put up the Christmas lights. He tried to put up a protest about it. But I knew just what to do to get my way with him. Sex always worked with him. I could go further, but you have to read the book um, to know exactly what happened next. Okay. But the bottom line is it wasn't a healthy sexual relationship because I learned early that sex wasn't healthy. It's not healthy to try to touch a five-year-old. It's not healthy to engage children in sexual acts. So because that was placed in me as a child, as an adult, I continued to perpetuate those cycles. Okay. Also, and this is the part that I was talking about earlier. A lot of times when women go through child sexual abuse, they have higher incidence of domestic violence. That's just true. If you think about your own situation or you think about someone you know, if you know that they've gone through sexual abuse and you see that they're going through domestic violence, it's a high correlation. You know, for myself, I told you early on in the book how I started being touched at five. So by the time I'm 38 years old, I find myself behind the barrel of a 38 being shot multiple times in my face, in my neck, in the back of my head and in my back and my 10 year old daughter being shot as well. Why? because the gateway had been opened at five. See, your skin is your first boundary, okay? We all need boundaries, but our skin is our first boundary that protects us from everything. And once that skin has been broken, your very first God-given boundary is broken and you, you really don't have a lot of boundaries going forth. You don't know how to say no. You always feel intimidated and allow people to run over you or to use you. And this is the case in domestic violence relationships. I don't have time to get into it, but we will later, okay? I just wanted to give this to you right now. Women that are involved in, well, let me say this first about the men. Men that are usually um, sexually or physically violent towards women usually cheat a whole lot. Just this, this statistically, scientifically, I can add the, um, some of the research that I found on this video if you're interested. So just say, show me the research and I will. But they have a higher likelihood to cheat and um, to, to not be faithful, right? So what ends up happening to the women? She has a higher rate of STIs, sexually transmitted infections. We called them STDs back then. It's a new, new word now, STIs. And um, they're less likely to use condoms because they feel 
pressured by the male not to do it, even though they know, hey, it's not right. Um, I may not want to, but because remember I told you that thing about the boundaries, not knowing how to say no, so they end up allowing it to happen, and then boom, they end up with an STI. Um, also, women in this situation are likely to end their unsafe relationships only when they have a new one that they feel can keep them safe from the old one. That's what happened in my situation too. I, um, after, well, right before we were shot, I met a man named Michael. We went out on four dates together and then I was shot right? But immediately upon meeting Michael, I sized him up for his ability to protect me. I thought, number one, I feel safe with this man. And number two, I think he can keep me safe from my ex-husband. So I made a quick decision to get into a relationship because I thought I'm trying to preserve myself. I am ready to leave that destructive relationship and I didn't know how to protect myself. I didn't know what I needed to do. So I thought my answer would be found in what? Another man. Why? Because that has been my story since I was five years old. On page 137, let me find it real quick. In my book, it says, at the end of chapter 13, God had sent me the man of my dreams at last. I learned that I could feel happy again. I could feel alive again. I could feel safe again. But I was relying on another man to make me feel whole again. And that usually is a, is a recipe for disaster. You'll have to read the book in order to find out what happened with Michael and myself. Born of Violence by Kimi Motley. Now listen, if you're already involved with an abusive man, I didn't touch a whole lot on abuse today, but if you're already involved with an abusive man, I want you to speak to an advocate. You can go to domesticshelters.org and it'll pull up all of the shelters in your area. And you don't have to go to a shelter. I'm not saying that at all. But if you speak with an advocate at the shelter, they can help you make a safety plan because you need a safety plan. Repeat after me, safety plan. One more time, safety plan. You need a safety plan. They'll help you create a safety plan. They'll give you some counseling or refer you to some counseling. They'll help you get in a good support group. All those things you need, whether you stay in the relationship or not. You want to stay, you need a safety plan, you need a support group, you need counseling. You want to leave, you need a safety plan, you need a support group, you need counseling. But don't make any decisions by yourself. And if you don't hear another thing I'm telling you, if you don't hear another thing, if you choose to leave him, don't tell him. Don't. Only choose to leave with a plan. I always tell the women I help, this is like Harriet Tubman and the Underground Railroad, baby. We make a plan first and then we escape. And there's no turning back. Plan first escape in order to keep you safe because a woman is at the most danger when she leaves all right so i love you all get my book born of violence on my website kimyamotley.com if you want an autograph copy or on amazon.com if you want it quick you know we have those deals on amazon and i'm also part of this group called marcy's law which we'll talk more about later but in november i want you to remember to vote yes for crime victims rights okay love you all bye bye